Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 49. What's the difference between writing code for yourself and developing for others? What new considerations do you need to take into account as a professional Python developer? This week on the show, we talk to Dane Hillard about his book, Practices of the Python Pro. Dane discusses his philosophy on the design principles that go into writing code. We talk about namespaces, object-oriented design, and how to keep your code extensible. We also consider the how and when of code optimization. This episode is brought to you by PyCharm. Do you want to get your work done faster? Use PyCharm, the Python IDE for professional developers. So let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hi, Dane. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Yeah, we've been talking for the last nine months about trying to figure out a, a time to get you on the show and talk about your book. And we were just talking offline before we started. Your book came out just about a year ago at the time of this recording. Yeah, that's right. I think right around January 20th. So that's tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Well, how's the response been? It's been pretty good. You know, with these things, and especially being my first book, I guess, I didn't really know what to expect. I think... I, I got a lot more sort of activity and engagement from people than I expected. And, you know, it's being translated currently into Chinese and Korean as well. Oh, cool. And I think the, the Korean one, I think, is close to done because I just got an email about getting a copy of it. So I'm pretty excited about that. And to sort of think that it's spreading to other countries, I think, was, you know, big enough achievement but other continents is kind of kind of uh more than i <laughs> yeah i would have expected of anything so it's pretty cool and that's the publisher that's helping with all that uh localization language stuff so manning actually doesn't do translations uh they typically will partner with another publisher who's interested in doing the translation so it kind of goes through a whole new set of contracts and uh, advances and all that stuff so still still getting to that point where it's going to start selling copies in China and Korea and seeing how the response is there. Yeah, cool. I mean, Python is definitely <laughs> a global phenomenon, <laughs> as we've mentioned yeah, absolutely. so many times on the show. This is the first book you've written, is that right? That is right, yep. What was the process like for you? So uh, the, the whole thing started, I guess, uh, when Manning reached out to me, uh, which I don't know if is is always typical, but they do have people on staff who sort of see who on the internet is already writing and might be interested in writing a book. So I'd been doing some blogging online for a time. And so someone reached out and said, hey, have you ever thought of writing a book? And I, I don't know that I had at the time up to then. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it had been something I was enjoying. And I, I very much like sort of sharing my experiences with people if they can be helpful. So I figured it would be a good idea. And I think that Manning's process actually ha has a lot of the same things that I've seen with the real Python editorial process. Yeah. That's really good. So they have a big focus on sort of optimizing for the right level of reader and making sure everything you're doing is speaking to that intended audience and, and just really trying to drive home the learning, which just kind of makes everyone involved successful. So they sort of pair you with an editor throughout the process, sort of a, a development editor, learning editor, and then each of your chapters gets reviewed by a technical editor. And then sort of at the end of the book, they do the production, uh, copy editing and typesetting and all that stuff. So yeah, I found it pretty smooth for the most part and pretty enjoyable. My editor was great. So I talked to a couple different authors who've written in a format where there was like an early release of chapters as they kind of went along. 
and then the you know the final sort of version was released on on a specific date. Was that your experience in, with this book? It was, yeah. Manning has the Manning Early Access Program, or MEEP is usually how they, they stylize that. So I enjoyed that quite a bit too. I think getting early and frequent feedback from people is the best way to make sure you're kind of maintaining your trajectory and not, not you know, totally off course, I guess, uh, in either <laughs> what you're teaching or how you're teaching it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. How, how long was the overall process? Oh gosh, it was a little longer than I expected. I think I hoped it might be around a, a year or a little less than that. It went a bit longer than a year, I think. <laughs> okay. I want to say that, and, and I guess part of it wasn't just me, you know, there's other phases, I guess, that people have to go through. Yeah. Yeah. The editing process and the, I'm guessing the feedback loop is uh, going to add time into all those steps. Yeah, exactly. So I think I think it was something like 16 months or something from sort of contact to printed book. Okay. So one of the things I thought that's different, you know, with the title is the focus and sort of the intended developer. Who who did you feel like was the intended Python developer for your book? That's a good question and one I like to clarify sometimes because uh, I think there's a pretty maybe broad, not broad definition, but definitely opposing views on on sort of what a pro is in programming. And I come very much from a place that if you're making money doing something, you're, you know, technically a professional. Okay. The title is meant to convey sort of that um, if you if you plan to be doing this full time, here are some interesting things to think about. That's that's kind of what I'm trying to say. So I think that the audience is anyone who's kind of new to programming or new to Python or, you know, especially switching into the industry from some other place. You know, there's a lot of people joining software development from maybe still even technical fields, but sort of less day-to-day -day programming like data analysis or stats or something like that, right? Getting those folks on board and, and talking about, you know, software can be written to work, but then what do you do with it after that in terms of design and testing and making sure that things will last a long time. So that's the idea. Yeah, I think of that in a way like, I don't know, we were talking about this generalism thing before the idea of like having <laughs> lots of different backgrounds, but I have done photography in situations where I've been paid, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's not my everyday thing. Technically, I've had clients. <laughs> I've had to work around certain specific events. I've done photography for races, you know, for like a marathon. Mm -hmm. And I've had to do them for like graduations and other things like that. And so technically, yeah, you know, that that kind of moves me into this other category of being a professional photographer. And so there's like these other kind of unique demands that that system's going to look at and sort of a level of it's not necessarily always the things of that people think of like i need to be able to deliver a, a consistent product <laughs> to somebody you know and that that they're going to be able to right. be willing to say yes you know we're going to keep hiring this person <laughs> does, does this analogy kind of fit in some ways it does and i i actually understand exactly where you're coming from because i have done some professional photography too and so with this analogy right this this book would kind of be like now that you're starting to do this more often and maybe looking to do it all the time you might want to start thinking about how you book clients on a regular basis or how you like what to look out for what to what to avoid when booking weddings or what to <laughs> right. like you know those those kinds of things where it's like if you do it once in a while even if you do it wrong uh, or some way that that you don't enjoy it, you only have to deal with it every so often but then once you're doing it every day you don't want to have to deal with those same pains all the time yeah okay so that's kind of the focus is this idea of okay so you're going to take this thing seriously, <laughs> right? You're actually going to look for a job in this, in this field, and this is going to be the tool that you're going to use for it. Here, here are the things that you may not have thought about. Is that part of it? Yep. Okay. Cause even in, even in sort of the 
quote unquote traditional software background, like going to a university with a four year degree in computer science. Not, some of these subjects still aren't even touched on there too hard. At least they definitely weren't uh, at the time that I was in school. So, you know, getting some some sort of hands on experience or first hand look at what some of these things are, a lot of which come kind of from maybe some open source community ideas, uh, collaboration and and looking at what needs to be in place to consider code kind of ready for production. Those kinds of things I think aren't as rigorously touched on in school either. So kind of giving folks a, a handle on here's here's what a lot of teams are doing in organizations in the real world is the focus. Yeah, that makes sense. Did you have some of those experiences yourself potentially coming out of school and uh, getting into you know professional development yeah i think even even in my first job out of school at the time i was doing c and c plus plus development and a bit and a bit of matlab which actually jibed very well with my school curriculum at the time but i i hadn't really done any testing okay aside from aside from you know submitting code to an auto grader and this first job right out the gates had a full test harness and was pretty rigorously tested and had coverage thresholds and, and all that stuff. And so I kind of had to get up to speed pretty quickly on that stuff because you can't you can't necessarily be productive in that environment without following some of those rules that have been put in place, usually for good reason. So that makes sense. How was the organization as far as getting you up to speed? Were there ways that they helped you with that or was it very sink or swim the people were good and and willing to help uh on that kind of stuff i don't know that i recall getting sort of an onboarding if you will into it (laughs) sure of course this has to vary from organization to organization right but some some test suites will be somewhat self-explanatory and when they fail they tell you why and they tell you where to look and and all that stuff and some i'm sure don't give you that kind of help, right? So getting some kind of conceptual foundation uh, about what all these things are, I think just ends up being some tools in your belt for feeling more comfortable exploring into the areas that you have less less experience or exposure to. As you shifted to doing testing inside of Python, what was your thoughts about the tools and how are you using the tools now? So for a long time, I was using nose okay and i I trying to remember if there was a time where i i kind of just relied on unit test as the built-in thing that was available i think i pretty quickly got onto nose and then nose sort of fell by the wayside and i i'm a pretty big proponent of pi test these days i think that it matches the mental model for me uh that is similar to when I'm actually writing executable code. And I like a lot of the integrations that it has for testing Django apps and running under Tox and all that stuff. Not that unit tests can't do those same things, but I think anything that sort of enhances the ergonomics of a system tend to be where I gravitate. So PyTest lets you parameterize functions, uh, test test functions, that is. Um, It lets you pretty quickly monkey patch things instead of mocking things and writing a lot less boilerplate code is all good stuff to me. Yeah. And it seems to have such a you know wide audience of people using it. And therefore there's a lot of contributions like you were mentioning the sort of the inclusions of stuff for inside of Django and I'm guessing a lot of other frameworks. So that hopefully some of the initial legwork has been taken care of for you. Yeah, exactly. When did you feel like you were becoming a Python pro? <laughs> when did you feel like that? <laughs> maybe, so I was just talking about ergonomics and maybe it's kind of in that space where when you have enough of a handle on what it is you're working on on a day-to-day basis enough to kind of say, hey, I, now that I understand this as well as I do, I see that there are some things we could improve about it that would make everyone's lives a lot easier. To me, that's you know, in my earlier uh, statement, right? Too that like you're a pro if you're getting paid to do it, right? But I think both of those are true. But like when I kind of internalized it for myself was when I was like, 
oh, maybe I could inject some of my experience and help make things better for people. Okay. So when you kind of start to move into uh, mentoring potentially other people. Yeah. And, that, you know, maybe I, I would say maybe like professionalism is kind of a milestone achievements in that sense, right? Like you're a pro if you're getting paid, you're a pro at many points along the way. And I don't think, uh, sure. I don't think it makes sense to gatekeep anyone in that sense. Right. right. And it's not necessarily an end point, you know, exactly. There's always, <laughs> as everything is constantly evolving and, and growing around all of us that we're all going to have to keep learning and, and, and learning from each other. Exactly. Don't waste your time configuring your IDE for your Python project. Get everything out of the box. With PyCharm Pro, you get expert Python assistance, including smart refactorings, code completion, and an integrated debugger. Web development support for popular frameworks, such as Django and Flask. Get your project up and running with three free months of PyCharm Professional Edition. Click on the PyCharm banner in the episode description and use the real Python 21, that's all caps, R E A L P Y T H O N 2 1 coupon code at checkout. The offer ends on March 31st. When you're getting into creating the book, what was the topic that you were like, okay, I'm super eager to share this? You know, I think it is interesting because I, I originally had this pretty grandiose plan, I think, for this book that touched on a lot more around sort of formal design patterns and things like that and and maybe a little bit more of the the process of of software development as a as a whole and i think it was it was ambitious but i think some of the things that i originally intended to bring in that did make it in were still around design so talking about extensibility in code and i guess this idea of loose coupling generally uh, and how to how to think about loose coupling between different parts of your code were two that kind of excited me and maybe it's also because that is a place that's pretty hard to reach any kind of endpoint on to right um like you can you can always think of ways to make your code easier to work with and and make sure that when you're touching this area of code that this area over there doesn't break or change so i think the fact that i'm still probably very much in the you know, middle of that experience uh, made it an exciting thing to try and teach others about. Okay. To kind of go into a couple of those ideas that you're mentioning there, you start off pretty early on in the book, just sort of describing what the book's about and kind of your approach. And then you dive pretty deep into design. Like you said, what is it about design that, that you think is sometimes missing when somebody starts creating code that they're, or maybe even an organization they make missteps in in that place. Yeah, I think it it ties back a little bit to that idea of ergonomics because you can make code work and that may be perfectly sufficient depending where you're at, right? Like if you are an early stage startup or something and you're just trying to ship things out the door, you know, getting working code is is the most valuable thing. But there's, you know, inflection points there as you mature and and some point at some point maintaining that code and making sure you don't go down are more important than uh shipping new features right so so design is kind of this idea of taking what works and making sure that it's easy for others to use it the way it's intended and to have kind of kind of uh guardrails if you will or or some sort of guidance that leads you to the right way of doing things and right just meaning functional i guess in that in that sense so taking the time to understand what you would want to write to interact with a class or something uh, and then taking that outcome that you want and building the class in a way that meets those outcomes uh, can be a pretty useful way to think about things instead of just sort of writing the class and hoping it ends up where you want to (laughs) go yeah when I was thinking about you talking about that design process, it kind of started to unfold into this idea of like, okay, the code needs to be usable, 
there's this depending on you know if it's something that's for public consumption or if the audience is like uh, inside of a company and they're your coworkers, but they're going to be using your tools. And then there's the design so that you can, can keep maintaining it. And then potentially the people behind you or others on your team <laughs> can maintain it. And so there's like all these kind of layers of, I don't know, communication mm-hmm. that need to be within your code to you know, make sure <laughs> through that whole process that it's designed that each one of those is accessible. Yeah. I think all of those have slightly different and nuanced considerations, right? Any any audience you might intend to serve, uh, you kind of have to think about what their goals are and what is the most important thing to them and try to accommodate as much as you can while still being in some kind of sustainable model, right? Yeah. And so you start out kind of diving into that a little bit uh, with namespaces, which I thought was an interesting sort of topic to kind of dive into, but it's, it's funny how that seems to be a theme, you know, throughout Python that, that, uh, I think, you know, people still kind of struggle with a little bit, (laughs) you know, why did you want to focus on that? So it it can act as this kind of, uh, I mentioned earlier, kind of a guidance toward doing things a particular way, I think namespaces can reflect back some sort of mental model about, you know, if I'm using some package, if there's a particular set of namespaces in that package, it it might really help me understand how that code is organized and like how the author intended for it to be used. Some are obvious, I guess, more obvious when there's a, a namespace called deprecation or something like that, where it's like, okay, maybe this code is going to go away someday. Right. And some I think are, are much more nuanced uh, and some maybe didn't have any particular design choice behind them other than I need to put this code somewhere. <laughs> I remember last year, the the guys on Python Bytes talking about, you know, the common thing of like a utils you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, directory yeah. or whatever package, you know, namespace. And you're like, oh no, <laughs> like, well, we'll just throw it in here, you know, as far as a way of, of uh, continuing on from <laughs> where we're at. Right. Like the only thing that might tell you is that it's not the entry point of the code or something, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That sort of structural at the modular, you know, kind of sp- development step <laughs> is kind of hard to change and then potentially if someone is going to use your code like let's say it's even more of an open source or an api or something like that for you to to shift that around is going to potentially create these breaking changes right yeah it is and it's it's interesting i guess because namespaces are pretty typically thought of i think as as sort of a taxonomy or a hierarchy but there, there are a few tricks and, and tools that Python has to help you achieve something a little more like an ontology, if you will, where you can sort of access parts of it from different, different paths. And I think those can be pretty dang useful uh, when you're trying to deprecate something or when you're trying to make some change that doesn't break existing usage where you can, you know, import something from some namespace and then kind of proxy it along through another namespace path uh, to either avoid avoid those breaks or better communicate what's going on. I think of like all the the future stuff, right? That was happening during yeah. uh, the shift between Python 2 and Python 3. Yeah, that's a really good example. And Django, I think, makes good use of this in some places too. It's interesting because I, I, when I started to work with others and follow a lot of other tutorials and stuff. It was not uncommon to see a lot of use of the, the import, you know, asterisk kind of thing Mm -hmm. inside of code. And then pretty quickly, I was like seeing all these places sort of frowning upon it. (laughs) Yeah. And I was like, Oh, okay. (laughs) I'm starting to see like, okay, just dumping all of these things into your main space namespace is going to potentially cause like these weird kind of collisions also you know like if you are you know renaming things that are built in or or things that are part of like the common libraries that you use it's just it's it's such a strange kind of step and i 
I don't see it as much anymore. Maybe even the last year and a half, I'm seeing less and less of that practice, mm-hmm. but it might be just the group I'm hanging with now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I was, it was interesting when I started that I would see that very often, um, as just like, okay, just do this, you know? And it's like, okay, well, that is, here's, <laughs> here's all these potential problems you're going to run into. Yeah. I think if you write enough unit tests that are mocking other code, um, you, you f- I, I definitely have run many times into trying to patch a particular import or in a, you know patch a particular name from somewhere and uh, finding that my patch didn't work because I tried to patch it at the wrong namespace instead of the one where it was being used when the code ran and things like that. So yeah, that's a kind of good exercise in understanding namespaces. Yeah. You mentioned overriding built-ins. Uh, I was using Sphinx the other day, and it has a, a copyright variable in its configuration file. And my IDE told me this name shadows the built-in copyright. So I learned that there's a, a copyright built-in that just tells the Python copyright. <laughs> I didn't know that day. either. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, it's like some of these practices I've seen over the last year or so of working with different tutorials and, and learning this stuff and seeing some of these practices of, you know, like using dir and, and using that method and function to like, kind of just, okay, print out what's going on, mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of learning what's in your global space, what's in your local space and kind of like just starting to see, you know, there it's, there's a lot under the hood, <laughs> you know, but also kind of learning from that structurally. Like you, you started to talk about thinking about, okay, if you're going to start building on top of that, what are some of the practices that you feel people should use when they're thinking about using classes and sort of object oriented design? Yeah, I think a lot of it is also a way to group like things, right? So namespaces can be used that way. Classes are namespaces in a in a sense. I don't know if strictly speaking that's true by definition, but they certainly kind of act as a way to group a set of related functionality, right? Right. And especially when you couple them with data that you need to to instantiate, bringing a number of related methods to bear on that data is exactly what a class is good at. So from that perspective, they act both as as, as sort of that namespacing functionally speaking, but also as a, a good way to sort of keep that mental model of like, okay, this this class handles this particular set of concerns. So when you use the term loose coupling what do you mean by that sort of at a at a high level the idea with loose coupling is that two pieces of code that are meant to handle different concerns when making changes to those or or when using those having as little interaction between the two uh, as possible like you as the developer not having to worry if i'm changing this code over here that I also need to think about and worry about and make changes related to this other code over here. Okay. It, it sort of sounds maybe even intuitive, right? Like people generally in school or, or early on in programming learn, like write a function for reusable behavior. But, and, and then so extending on that, it's like, well, if I have two different behaviors, I have two different functions. But when you get into bigger programs and complex systems and you have a class that looks like it does one thing, but then you have to pass in six parameters because of some other class that's also getting passed into its init function or init method, things start to get a little hairy. Okay. So it's like building on top of a, a hierarchy. And so down at like a lower level, it, it may require a lot of additional maintenance, especially if you're creating things that do more than one thing and, and, and potentially, uh, I don't know, you're trying to be clever and reuse this code in a way that, that, oh, well, I could do this also. And, and is that where you might kind of fall down this sort of hole of, of tying things together? <laughs> yeah. I think that a lot of times Code code reuse uh, probably is a number one contributor to later weird complexity. <laughs> okay, maybe some one of the one of the biggest things I've probably learned in the past three years is that it's like 
half the time or more better to duplicate some code and figure out the abstraction later than it is to try and reuse that code right there in the moment. You had mentioned earlier, and, and we've talked about it on the show a little bit about functional programming. Uh, maybe you could you know, define that a little bit because I, I feel like this is where it sort of fits in. Yeah. Like, what, what does it mean for something to be functional programming? Yeah. So the idea with functional programming is that m- most or all, I guess, of the code is functions uh, and it's sort of in opposition, if you will, to object-oriented programming. So there aren't classes and methods. Uh, they're, they're only functions. And there's this big idea around pure functions, which take in some inputs and return an output, and they don't modify anything in between. Okay. They, like if the output depends entirely on the inputs. And a, a functional program is sort of this composition of all of these functions uh, into something that, that produces a result that you want. And I think... My, my personal take on it, I guess, is that both have both object oriented and functional programming have their space to be used and can totally coexist uh, in some applications. And I, I think may, it, it may be good to have boundaries between them uh, if you have sort of an object oriented space and a functional space. But um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not maybe, uh, I don't know maybe 10 years early in my career to yeah to know the uh the real value of strictly one way or the other i guess well i i can kind of understand what you're saying where like structurally if you had the idea of like sort of processing things it makes sense to me like the whole idea of like okay this function is going to you know process this data and you like you said you, it shouldn't affect other things around it <laughs> mm-hmm. it should you know take an input and you know create this output and there shouldn't be any side effects or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Along with that, you know, depending on the application, if you're not just simply processing data, you're like storing it or you're uh, having to deal with state and you're then maybe that's where it shifts into like object oriented sort of stuff. And so I, I kind of see what you're saying, like this idea of these, you know, kind of different kind of roles for your code, you know, as, as you're working. Yeah. And so that, that makes sense to me that, and I could see how functional programming in general lends itself to reusability in a lot of ways too, that, you know, if you've written the code in a certain way that it hopefully should be able to be, you know, potentially reused in these other places since it, it, it is very uh, modular, you know, and it does this one main thing. And I, th- I think what, what all of these things sort of culminate into this idea of loose coupling and functional versus object oriented programming and lack of side effects and state management and all these things is is kind of like, if you can balance all of those things, if you can spin all of those plates, right. (laughs) Then you can kind of come away with this uh, body of work that if someone needs to add some new functionality it's less a matter of delving into the code and figuring out exactly which knobs to turn and more uh, about like, okay, I see this class here and I see that if I write a subclass of it and override this particular method that it will do its job. Yeah. And and that's that's what you get out of a lot of successful frameworks, right? Like in Django, if you're writing a view to handle listing the details of some uh, data model, then you can you can subclass the Django views generic detail view uh, and just tell it which data model that you're looking for. And then it, it kind of handles the rest for you. So that's part of this idea of extensibility. And you can also get at this idea of loose coupling by being smart about what inputs you give to things. So if you, instead of, just supplying some raw data if you can pass in a class uh, or you know an object that fills the role of something that can be a better way to get extensibility and it can also be a really nice way to make your testing easier this week i want to shine a spotlight on another real python video course 
When you're starting a project, one of the big decisions you need to make is how are you going to store and work with data? Python provides a variety of built-in tools. This course is titled Dictionaries and Arrays, Selecting the Ideal Data Structure. The course is based on a real Python article by Dan Bader, and in the course, previous guest Christopher Trudeau is your instructor, and he takes you through what are the advantages of using the built-in dict type? What are four other types of dictionaries? How list and tuple types are arrays? What are typed arrays, and how can they save memory? What are the practical uses for the different types, and how do you select the ideal data structure for your programs? I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn the variety of ways of storing and managing data in your Python programs. The choice of the right data structure will affect the readability of your code, ease of writing, and performance. And like most of the video courses on Real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections and has code samples for the techniques shown. This course also has transcripts and closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. So that term extensible, it seems like it has a, a couple different meanings. You know, like initially, like the idea could be, you know, literally extending your code, like be, being able for you yourself to be able to, you know, build on, on top of it. But what are other things that it, it implies? I think that the, the biggest thing about extensibility is that you can't predict the future. Right, okay. And that, that future could be you. In fact, it's often you like six months from now when you <laughs> yeah. forget what code you wrote. But also, if you, if you do want eventually to make something, you know, an open source project or even just want to see it be more widely used within your organization, making something that does one thing exactly the way you think of right now uh, can only go so far. And so you have to kind of understand, well, somebody probably wants to be able to do it this other way. And I don't know exactly what that looks like. And I want them to be able to say more about that when they're using the code. Okay. So that's, that's like where building in extensibility kind of lets you say, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what you're going to do, but I'll let you figure that out. I'm going to leave you the space uh, to be able to do that and not paint you into a corner <laughs> per se. Right. Yeah. And uh, a lot of, a lot of resources online liken this idea to this, you know, they say modularity and, and things like that. So a lot of them, I picture sort of like a Mr. Potato Head or something, right? Okay. Like <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to give you a potato and you can put your decor on it however uh suits you you know um within reason there's still only a few places where you can add decor and um, everything takes a particular rough shape in the end but there's some spectrum of flexibility there how do you feel the state of that world is in the the package space of python as a person who's not spent that much time in it you know I'm approaching three years of time inside working with python do you how do you feel having spent more time about the extensibility of like a lot of the packages and stuff in the Python space? I mean, I mentioned Django as, as sort of a good example of this. Um, I think other web frameworks are in a similar space. Uh, Flask and fast API and things like that are doing a pretty good job of it. Yeah. I think a lot, a lot of these things that are frameworks of some kind are really they, they almost have to do this well in order to benefit from any kind of popularity, in my opinion, because as soon as you try to, you know, you've gone through the work of uh, creating a virtual environment and picking some package you want to try and installing it and then writing some code and finding out, oh, geez, this doesn't do what I want. And I don't think there's a, I don't think there's any way for them to let me do what I want you kind of are ready to move on, right? Yeah. So packages that, that sort of predict the future by explicitly saying we can't predict the future <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are the ones that, that I think end up going a long way. And it's, it's tough because by saying you're not going to 
do any particular thing, you are making a choice to be maybe less useful to some particular subset of people. And so you have to run that balance of like, my package does something useful, but also you can tell it to do other things. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually impressed by it. It, you know, just the, I mean, obviously there's thousands and thousands of packages out there, but mm-hmm. um, the ones that I've come upon in general, like, I feel like they've been created in a way that allows that, you know, I don't see them necessarily disappearing or there seems to be as a community, an audience that focuses on these particular ones. Like you mentioned the pie test, which it seems like has almost this almost universal appeal um, from most people that I, you know, hear about, if you're going to get into testing, this is the, the thing to use. And, and it seems like that seems to be pretty, pretty common around all these different packages. I mean, obviously there's new things that come along, but so that excites me in a lot of ways. I'm, I was having this conversation with Brett after our, our recording about JavaScript. And for a little while there, I was attempting to learn JavaScript and <laughs> it was really hard, you know, cause it was just like, even at the time I went, it would be like this thing where you would look at the dates of, uh, things and try to decide like, okay, well, where am I going to jump in? Because it's just moving so fast and there's like so much f- froth in the water, you know, <laughs> of like, yeah. where, where should I even spend my energy? And I don't feel that way as much in, in Python. I've felt like, okay, I can, I can get in here and start building things. And, and it, it is a community where stuff sort of does seem to build on top of other things, which is great. Yeah. And I, you know, as an admitted sort of latecomer to the Python ecosystem, right, relatively speaking, I suppose, I don't know if there was a time maybe where Python had a similar feeling to it, maybe. Yeah. You know, I think I think with a lot of things um, that become popular quickly, they obviously have some sort of value that people are flocking to. But then you do sort of have this bloom of everything that's possible. Yeah. <laughs> and then afterward you sort of have this it's sort of like the big bang in a way right like you, there's this period immediately after the big bang where there's just this intense infinity of hot matter and it's everywhere and then as as time goes on things sort of like coalesce and become you know a little more cohesive where there are like things kind of you know, bonding and fusing and whatever. Like it's maybe a things becoming habitable <laughs> in a way. Yeah, like yeah. it it slowly kind of works itself out in a sense. So yeah, maybe maybe Python has you know entered that phase and JavaScript is gonna go there. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's been interesting watching other languages um, when you start to decide on one, and you know. Yeah, it's been interesting. Yeah. You talk a lot about optimizing code in the book. And I was wondering, like, what are the common pitfalls of of trying to optimize code? The, the biggest pitfall probably is trying to optimize code too early. Okay. And so I kind of emphasize this in the book, like, try to try to do most things with some sort of actual metric if you can. And specifically, you try to shoot for things that will change the efficiency of your code by some order of magnitude rather than just these incremental improvements. For certain applications, incremental improvements might be all that's left to do or, or whatever, right? Uh, for real-time, more close to real-time applications, you are probably trying to eke out little improvements. But on the whole, it's like if you can change something from growing in size with the number of items in your list if you can make it constant time instead that that kind of thing is is the kind of change you want to go for so there's like the time it module built into python there's a couple of things that kind of riff off of its functionality in the in pypi yeah and so measuring if you if you're specifically trying to improve your performance measuring the before and after of those changes is really helpful in kind of understanding well i changed this and i see that it improved a little bit but not as much as i hoped why is that and it helps you build hypotheses and prove or disprove them as you go yeah i was talking to some other python people earlier about the idea of profiling mm-hmm. and trying to pay attention to you know where 
things are taking time, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, like it may not be obvious to you. You might look at something that like is a large chunk of code and you would make an assumption that, oh, that, that must take a lot of time. And you can sort of, you know, without ever measuring it, <laughs> completely optimize the wrong thing. Is, is that mm-hmm. kind of what can happen, you feel like? Absolutely. And I, I think to your point, like if you have a large method that's called once in in your code execution, whether it's a script you're running or a request lifecycle or whatever, if it's called once and it takes a second, right. that might sound bad. But if you have a different function that's called a thousand times and takes a hundred milliseconds each time, you know, you have to weigh how those things actually impact your your user, whether it's you or someone out on the internet. And I think a lot of times, yeah, it's easy to just look at something and say, well, I think this is slow. I'll make it fast. <laughs> right. well, what does slow mean? What does fast mean? Is it fast or slow relative to the rest of the code? Those are the kinds of things you have to think about. Yeah. I, I feel like there's a lot of philosophy in your book. <laughs> it's maybe, maybe to a fault. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like it doesn't, it doesn't have as much strict code in it. I mean, there are obviously coding examples in it, but it feels like there's a lot, a lot of, well, there's just a lot of thought went into it. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really, you know, when I talked about this sort of large ambition of a book, I, I think that's a lot of what I really wanted to expound on even more is this like, yeah talking about ways of thinking about these things rather than just saying here do it uh, i want to tell you it's like teaching a person to fish instead of catching the fish for them uh, in a way and I, I want people to have the right sort of tools and mental models to be able to f- go figure this stuff out themselves yeah cool so i have these weekly questions i like to ask everybody and the first one is What's something that you're excited about right now in the world of Python? This could be like an event, a package, coding tool, hardware, whatever. Yeah, I mentioned Fast API. I think that's something that's pretty interesting to me. Um, sort of the the growing space, I guess, generally of async web frameworks as a as a sort of full time web app developer. I think is uh, is pretty interesting to me. I started trying out Django Graphene recently, also, which is a plug-in, I guess, uh, for Django for turning your data models into a graph QL API. That's been pretty cool. So those are a couple of spaces that I'm kind of interested in at the moment. Is there a specific project that you need the sort of graph on? It, it sort of as it applies to work, there's, there's kind of a growing, I don't know what the right word is for it, growing practice, I guess, uh, of using GraphQL for communication between client-side applications and back-end services. So part of the benefit of that is asking only for the data that you need and also having typed schemas so that you can sort of validate that your queries are going to return what you think they are. So there's, there's a couple of good benefits to that. And we currently have a bunch of Django back-end stuff. Um, so I'm interested in seeing if that is a, a space for us to grow into. Cool. That sounds like it'll be super useful. Yeah. What's something that you want to learn next? I think I have a whole lot of room to learn in the async space. The, the async model in general is is sometimes hard for me to wrap my head around. But with Django bringing in lots of async capabilities and with fast API, a couple of new newer web servers, Uvicorn and things like that. Um, kind of interested in getting to know that a lot better. Do those tools abstract a lot of the async stuff for you? They do. Uh, some of it might be inescapable. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> like you still, but most of the time you probably can, can do things um, without a lot of change. Uh, but then when the abstraction leaks, it leaks pretty hard, I think. So there's a lot of, I don't want to call it magic, but there's a lot of stuff that most people probably don't, haven't taken the time and maybe don't have the time to dig down into to understand super well, right? So when it breaks, um, you have to be able to know what you did wrong in a good way. Yeah, where to go and and look at it. Yeah. In our earlier conversations, I was thinking about a, a, a question I got 
very early on in the podcast about where to find code that would be like a good example of, you know, like I was going to go out on GitHub and look at a particular project and I wanted to learn a little more about design by reading that code and looking at how they abstracted it, how they structured things, how they designed it. Do you have a particular library that you would say is a good example of that? I've mentioned Django a few times now, but I would I would say that the Django code base is a really nice one to go look at. And I think a, a phrase maybe that I didn't mention explicitly earlier uh, in our talks about extensibility was plugin-based architecture. Yeah. And I think Django is exactly that. It's a plugin-based architecture. And so seeing how they accomplish that task, I think is a really useful kind of way to to see how other people are doing things. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> I, their documentation is also first rate. So, yeah, it keeps getting better, which is yeah, which is great. And I love that they have, you know, lots of sort of examples to get you get you at least started with it. It's popular enough that, you know, there's lots of good resources, especially in real Python. We've been having a bunch on Django lately, which has been good. Mm-hmm. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing all that with us. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to have the opportunity. I appreciate it. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks. This episode was brought to you by PyCharm. Get a three-month subscription to PyCharm Professional Edition with this promo code, RealPython21. I want to thank Dane Hiller for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.